Good evening. I want to want to introduce myself. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Dr. Eileen Stansberry, the Chief Scientist at the Johnson Space Center, and welcome to the 55th Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. I want to introduce myself. Uh, okay. <laughs> So is that a purposeful time delay? Okay, hopefully we're off to a roaring start now. Um, uh, so again, I'd like to uh, make sure that everyone is welcome uh, to the beginning of uh, LPSC this year and especially to NASA night where our um, uh, headquarters uh, colleagues uh, provide us an opportunity for the community to uh, hear uh, from them and uh, so that they can answer any questions that the community has. Um, so first up on the agenda is Dr. Lori Glaze, the director of the Planetary Science Division. All right. Great. Awesome to have NASA night back at night. So this is awesome. Looking forward to this. Hopefully we won't be quite as time constrained as we have been when it's been a lunch uh, session. Um, before I get going here, I want to begin by just asking my headquarters team, everyone that is working for Planetary Science Division or SMD, uh, to, uh, to stand up for a moment. Just take a moment and be recognized. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I know y'all know this, right? But nothing happens without these people, right? I mean, I, I just sit there and wave my hands. They do all the work, right? So thank you all so much and for everything that you do. Um, okay, we've got a lot to cover here tonight. So if you can go on to the first slide. Next step. Oh, I have the thing right here. Look at that. I have control. So I'm going to start with a little story. I don't know how many people know what this is, but this is actually a pyroclastic flow from the 1991 Pinatubo eruption. It's not what you think. The reason I wanted to show this slide tonight, I have a longtime colleague, uh, collaborator, and friend, uh, Steve Beloga. Some of you from the community may remember him. He's been retired for a few years. But he and I worked together for years and years and years. And this morning, as I was sitting around thinking about what the, the day was going to hold, um, he sent me this picture on my cell phone. And he says, he says, you probably don't remember, Lori, but... This is the first slide you ever showed at LPSC in 1994, 30 years ago. So, see, it's not what you thought. Um, no, but for real, um, I, I love LPSC. I've been coming to this meeting since 1994, so 30 years. Um, I know I am nowhere close to holding the record uh, for the longest attendee here, but this meeting's near and dear to me and this community is, is near and dear to me. So I just thought I'd share that. And, you know, maybe it does portend what's happening in the budget, who knows. Um, but uh, don't quote me on that in the, you know, don't tweet that. Um, okay, so <laughs> just a few words on uh, some RPSD staff and some changes recently. I just wanna acknowledge uh, the contributions of Michael Meyer, who is our senior scientist for the Mars program and for MSR. Um, he recently retired and Jeff Grossman, who has uh, just contributed in so many ways to our research programs and as program scientist for Osiris Rex and, and many other things, uh, Jeff Grossman also recently retired. Um, so we, are, we miss them both uh, a great deal um, and we're working hard to try and fill, fill their big shoes. Um, we do have some other um, key uh, personnel changes, some, some changes in titles and, and roles, some that transitioned over uh, from, uh, from being an IPA to civil servants. Tom Statler, now the lead for Solar System Small Bodies, and then a few folks that we've hired as, as new civil servants at headquarters. Um, just a real quick shot of our uh, fleet chart. Uh, we are going to talk about challenges later, but please don't forget we have an amazing 
portfolio of work that we are doing in our program. The main changes on this chart still shows about 40 missions in our portfolio, but there's two little ones with wings on them. <laughs> that would be Peregrine and Odysseus. Um, and you're gonna hear a lot more about those from Joel Kearns a little later. Um, I wanna take a moment to, to really celebrate the amazing successes we've had um, over the last several months. Um, I think everyone is probably well aware of Cyrus Rex. Uh, we now have confirmed that we ha we collected uh, 121.6 grams of material. That's over twice the amount that was required. Incredibly successful mission. Yay, OREX. Yeah. And uh, a shout out to the science team and the curation team at Johnson Space Center for basically working night and day for months on end uh, to get that, that sample. Um, uh, measured and, and uh, get it ready for, for science analyses and curation. Uh, Psyche mission, uh, after of course the one year delay, a successful launch uh, in October. Uh, we're really, really excited. This mission is, is well on its way and doing a, doing a great job already. Um, just a real quick update on Perseverance, continuing to do great things on the surface of Mars. Um, I think we added up this morning that there's about 26 or 27 uh, sample tubes now that are full, another 13 or so to go. Um, doing a, a, a fantastic job of uh, investigating uh, the crater floor and now the, the fan and now the, the crater rim in Jezero. Um, just doing an amazing job there collecting those samples that will be returned by Mars sample return at some point, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Highest priority, the decadal survey, right? Um, and then we're going to we bid farewell to Ingenuity helicopter over there on the right. You can see uh, the shadow of the the uh, blade that uh, clearly sustained some damage uh, when we think it uh, encountered uh, a little bit of the sand on the surface. But uh, incredible mission, seventy two flights was only supposed to take five. Really amazing, amazing uh, technology demonstration. Um, I wanted to give a quick shout out to our Here to Observe program. Y'all have been hearing about this for a couple of years. We ran a pilot program where we uh, partnered a couple of our missions with some universities, uh, undergraduate students at uh, universities that are, are serving uh, underrepresented individuals uh, from our community. And we were really pleased with it. So we've expanded it now to six of our missions. And I'm gonna ask a few people to raise their hands if you if they're in this room. They might be in the other rooms, but I know we have some students from some of our H2O partnering institutions. Is there anyone in four? I'm not seeing anyone in four. Maybe, oh, I hear them, there they are. Yay, shout out. Shout out, shout out for all of our H2O partner students. Thank you all for coming. I'm really glad we were able to help support them to come and get to be a part of LPSC and have an opportunity to interact and engage with our planetary science community. Um, okay, let's see, we've got a few community announcements here um, and I'm gonna try and actually look at the slide and read it so I don't make a mistake uh, on what's on here. Um, this is a big deal. Um, a, a large part of our community has been very vocal about this for a long time about the fact that as, um, as US scientists funded by NASA, we were unable to um, even think about um, applying for, uh, to analyze samples that were collected by China uh, because of the Wolf Amendment. Um, but we did, uh, in November, uh, we were able to uh, have the administrator certify to Congress our intent to allow NASA-funded researchers to apply uh, for Chinese samples, which is a limited exception uh, to the Wolf Amendment. Um, there was, uh, we released uh, a notification to the community, so they knew that this was going to be allowed. We encouraged them to apply. As far as we understand, uh, CNSA received um, about 11, almost, I guess, about a dozen or so um, proposals um, from the U.S. Um, unfortunately, some of those were civil servant, but we we're still, this was happening really fast, right? So we are actually at this point not able to work the bureaucracy fast enough to support the civil servant scientists in this call, but we are expecting another call hopefully this summer that we can work through all the various paperwork for the civil servant scientists. But we are still hoping to support if we have some non-civil servant scientists in our community that are selected. If they're selected, we are hoping to be able to support them with the, the requisite um, NASA agreements. In order to do that, we need to know who applied. So <laughs> uh, 
Um, at this point, we're not exactly sure. This is lesson learned for us the next time that we need to be notified first. Um, but anyway, uh, if, if you applied or you know someone who applied and they would like to actually get NASA money once they get approval or if they get approval to look at samples, they need to contact us and let us know. So um, I'm just going to say contact me because that's the easiest thing to do and I'm easy to find. And then I'll connect you to Rebecca Levy, who will help you um, actually get the agreements in place if and when they're needed. All right. Um, as I said, uh, we expect another opportunity this summer. So we're really pleased. This is a huge step in being able to um, collaborate on samples. Um, I'm not going to talk through all of these. We've got a lot of NASA headquarters activities going on this week, various town halls and briefings and things. Take a picture with your cell phone if you like um, so that you've got all of these, but lots of fun things going on. Okay, one, two, three, going. Okay. All right. Um, uh, I'm going to talk for just a second about Mars sample return. Don't worry, we'll come back to this in a minute when we talk about budget. Okay, but I wanted to give you... <laughs> First, I want to talk about uh, where we are um, on Mars sample return. Um, I believe we've been briefed many times that uh, we we had an independent review board uh, that went and took a look at the, the architecture and the programmatic structure for Mars sample return last summer. They reported out in September um, that they said that currently the architecture was not achievable within the cost and schedule that we had allocated. Um, and that we needed to go back and relook at a few things. And um, so at that time, uh, NASA headquarters, Nikki Fox, uh, established a Mars sample return um, independent review board response team. I know lots of acronyms there. It's MIRT, M-I-R-T. Um, that's headed up by Sandra Connolly, who's uh, Nikki's deputy. Sandra's here with me tonight. So if we get any really hard questions, I'm sending them to Sandra. Um, but anyway, so the, the MERT has been looking at those recommendations um, over the last several months. While we were looking at those recommendations, we got some indication from Congress last summer um, from the Senate markup language back in July that indicated a, a significantly lower funding amount for Mars sample return this year. Um, and so we, in this year, uh, slowed down the Mars sample return activity uh, in part so that we can complete this response um, and come up with what the agency direction is going to be for Mars sample return, and in part to accommodate uh, the funding level that we anticipated. Um, as part of that, uh, the capture containment, it's either return or retrieval, it looked like it was different things in different places, but uh, CCRS, um, uh, that those activities uh, were stood down after they passed their uh, preliminary design review. And then uh, because of the reduced budget we anticipated, uh, we reduced the allocations um, to JPL for the sample return lander as well to make sure we could fit within uh, the funding that uh, ultimately is what we got in the 24 uh, appropriation. So the response team is working on the options um, that might be available to go forward. Um, and we are anticipating that they are going to uh, complete their work uh, by the end of March and that agency leadership will then uh, take those recommendations into consideration and develop what the next plan is. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, I did want to take a moment to talk about the Mars SAMP return uh, implementation team, the program team at headquarters. So you all are very familiar with Jeff Gramling. You've seen him speak many times as the director for the MSR program. But I just wanted to uh, flash up some of the folks on this screen that, that Jeff recently added to his team, uh, Donya uh, Douglas Bradshaw, who's also in the room with us here tonight. Uh, some of you may know Donya. She's a, you know, A1 top star. She delivered the Lucy mission on schedule and under budget. Boy, am I glad to have her on MSR. Oh, yeah. Um, and then uh, we also, he also recently added Steve Tebow from, who was uh, most recently at the Applied Physics Laboratory as a chief engineer. Again, top, top talent, really poised and ready to uh, successfully implement Mars sample return uh, when we're ready to move forward. Okay. Okay, now what everybody came here for. Actually, oops, let me see if I can go back one. Let's talk budget for a second. Um, all right. So just to kind of set a little context before we jump in, um, 
we, we uh, were fortunate that everything all came together at once. So we had no appropriation for 2024. Um, and then all of a sudden last week, uh, over the weekend, we have now an appropriation that was passed by Congress and signed into law by the president on Saturday. So now we have a 24 budget. We know what that is. We've been talking about uncertainty for months and months and months. That budget is has less uncertainty now. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then we also had just today the 25 uh, president's request for the 25 budget also came out today. So we're going to talk about both of those, but we'll try to keep it clear when we're talking about 24 and when we're talking about 25. And as you all know, when we've been talking about budget over the last oh nine months or so since last June, uh, when uh, Congress uh, and the administration agreed to the Fiscal Responsibilities Act, that was the agreement where, um, again, both Congress and the administration agreed to uh, curtail spending in fiscal years 2024 and 25. Um, and I just keep reminding people, this is not just curtailing spending for NASA. It's across federal government. Um, the, the constraints are on the non-defense discretionary programs. And we are one of just of, of many uh, government agencies that are subject to this cut. Um, so as we look through and we think about the, the allocations that we got, we need to keep in mind um, that no one's picking on us and we're, we're, all, <laughs> we're all going to get through this by standing together, um, by standing together and backing our decadal survey and being ready, uh, being ready when, uh, when the stakeholders are, are ready to kind of loosen the purse strings. We want to be ready there um, with the inspiration that I know planetary science can provide the nation and the world. Um, Okay, so let's jump into 2024. Oh, this isn't the version. That's interesting. I lost my, my grayed out sections, but that's okay. All right, so um, this is uh, for all of science. I just wanted to kind of give you a sense of where we fit into the science budget when we start talking about a balanced portfolio, not just within planetary, but within uh, the science mission directorate as well. Um, the first column is 2023, and that's the funding that we were appropriated in 2023. And so you can see top line numbers there, 7.795 for science, and then you can see the distribution. The next column is what the president proposed last year when he proposed for 2024. And so you can see that there were big increases anticipated all across the board um, in the science mission directorate. Now that was the budget that rolled out back in March and then Fiscal Responsibilities Act was passed in June. And so we knew right away that those ambitious 24 numbers were probably not going to materialize, but those were the numbers that Science Mission Directorate had been planning to. And we didn't know exactly where we were gonna end up in 24. We knew we were gonna have to make some difficult choices, but until we knew what the appropriation was, it's hard to know what those choices are. The next column is the bus, the, the bill, the minibus that just passed and was signed on Saturday. Um, and so you can see the top line numbers uh, for the directorate are lower. Um, and then you can see the rest of the numbers there as well. And the, the last two columns are deltas. And the reason I'm showing these, the, the first one is the delta back to the request the president made back in March. And you can see there were some really ambitious things in those programs um, that the other divisions, that planetary and the other divisions all were hoping to um, execute on. And so when you see the Delta to 2023, you see some flatline budgets, um, which looks pretty good, right? Earth science, and astrophysics, flatline. But there were some really hard decisions that had to be made in earth science in order to fit within the appropriated budget. When you look at the planetary budget, you can see that overall compared to last year, we're down the 483.3 million. Most of that is Mars sample return. And we're gonna talk more about that. So I just want you to recognize um, what most of that is. And you can see that at the top line of science that is also reflected um, primarily from our sample return. Okay, so let's talk about the 24 budget and what else is in the in the 24 budget. As I said, we're this kind of repeats some of that. We're 483 million than FY23. Um, that is a 15% reduction. Um, uh, 
But as I said, most of that can be accounted for by the reduced support to Mars sample return. What is included in the appropriation is MSR is to be funded at $300 million or more. Okay, so we're free to put more money on Mars sample return, but they only gave us $2.7 billion in the overall budget. Okay, so although the appropriation allows us to spend up to the 949.3 that we'd originally proposed, um, we want to make sure that whatever we implement for Mars sample return, I've said this many, many times, I'm going to continue to say it, uh, whatever we implement for Mars sample return is going to be done in the context of a balanced planetary science portfolio. Okay, so that is the number one priority. Uh, Mars sample return executed, but within the balanced portfolio. Um, okay. Um, there is some other additional language in the 24 budget uh, does call out the near earth object surveyor and provides a funding level for near uh, for neo surveyor. And then it also provides some funding in the new frontiers line, um, including uh, a, a value that they expect us to spend for dragonfly, which is fantastic Dragonfly is working their way towards confirmation. Um, and so we're very excited about that. So you can see along the bottom there, just kind of the trend. You can see back in 2014, we were at 1.3 billion, okay? Just look at the growth that we've had over the last 10 years. And yes, 24 is less than, than 22 and 23, but we've had a, an amazing run and we are doing some amazing work within that 2.7 billion. We got a lot more we wanna do and we have to make some tough choices, but that's, um, that's where we stand relative. I just want to put the, the bigger picture of where we are. And then this is the number that just came out today. I've just added there in the bottom right. That's the FY25 number that just came out today for planetary science, 2.731.5. Okay. So um, we're pretty commensurate with the 24 number in the president's request for 25. And again, these are consistent with the Fiscal Responsibilities Act of trying to constrain funding in 24 and 25. Um, the one thing I wanna mention for fiscal year 24, because the question will come up, what is the distribution across all of our various programs for 24? The way this process works is now that we have an appropriation and they did provide a few programs with specific funding levels, but we now have to go back and make some of those difficult, uh, you know, trades and decisions of where we're going to place the rest of the money to support all of our priorities and to uh, keep that, uh, maintain that balance within the program. And, and we develop what's called an operating plan. And then that operating plan has to be approved by the agency, by the administration, and then by Congress. So once we have an approved operating plan, this could take a few months. Once we have that, then we can share what the distribution of funding is across um, all of the various programs. In the meantime, we will provide guidelines to each of our programs, but just so you know, that's it'll take a little bit, but once we have that full funding laid out, we will share it with everybody. Okay, so let's talk 25. So we, we got the new budget today. Again, commensurate with the 24 numbers with a, a $2.7 billion number again. Um, within that, I am going to, I commit to you and, and Nikki Fox, these are actually Nikki's slides um, right here that I'm sharing with you right now. Um, we all are standing together to, to meet and to uh, stand up to the priorities that we've been outlining over the last year, which is as we have to make difficult decisions, we are putting our priority on the, our highest priority confirmed missions. Um, Psyche was on that list, but it's gone. So yay, Psyche, it has launched. Um, next on the list is Europa Clipper. Europa Clipper is launching in October. Um, the mission is doing amazing. They are really getting down towards um, launch. Um, and so we're, we're all keeping our fingers crossed that all of that stays on schedule and we get Clipper launch, but that is the first priority. The Near Earth Object Surveyor is another major priority, confirmed mission, meaning we have an official agency commitment to deliver the Near Earth Object Surveyor um, at a specific cost and on a specific schedule. And so we are committed to meeting um, that commitment. 
Uh, we are working very hard to support our international partnerships. Uh, we have very valuable partnerships with our international colleagues. So we're trying to uh, maintain those relationships on the JUICE mission, which is already on its way out to the Jupiter system, the JAXA MMX mission, Mars Moon Explorer mission, um, ESA's Rosalind Franklin mission, which we are really pleased that this budget um, is going to support, both the 24 and 25 budget is going to support Rosalind Franklin. Um, so we're very excited about that. And then um, our commitment to the Envision Venus mission. Um, we are going to ensure that decadal recommended science investigations are included in Artemis. So there's some substantial support uh, for uh, science on Artemis and for CLPS, the commercial lunar payload services. And as I've said many, many times before, working as hard as we can to sustain the planetary science research program um, and to keep it as protected as possible. As we know, as opportunities slip into the future, the research program is critically important to support our community. Um, okay, um, I need to move on. I'm gonna run out of time, so let's move on. Uh, so these are some of the highlights in the S uh, fiscal year 25 budget for planetary science. Um, I, I told you I'd come back to Mars sample return. Um, so, and I'm actually gonna come back one more time. This one just says that in the fiscal year 25 budget, uh, when you look at our, our budget out there, you will see that the MSR budget is TBD uh, in fiscal year 25. And what that means is that we anticipate an amendment to uh, the fiscal year 25 budget request that will identify what uh, that budget will be. And it that is, uh, contingent on what comes out of the, the response team. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, we support Europa Clipper, of course, Neo Surveyor, Dragonfly with an anticipated 2028 launch. We are supporting all three Venus missions, Da Vinci, Veritas, and Envision. Yes, Veritas is back in the budget. Thank you. Yeah. We've been working on it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mars Exploration Program, uh, we're supporting uh, operating missions, um, of course, uh, Perseverance and uh, Curiosity, and also some new investments in, in technology. This is an important win for us. We actually were able to, in this really tight time, we were able to secure $40 million for Mars technology in support of our future plan for Mars. So I think that's another big win for us. I'm very excited about that. And then a uh, very robust lunar discovery and exploration program there. Um, a couple more, I've already mentioned New Frontiers Discovery and Simplex AOs. This, this budget supports those calls um, no earlier than 2026. We've been talking about that for a while. Um, planetary technology strategy and project uh, to provide integrated technology developments. Um, um, as we've been saying, uh, Uranus Orbiter and Probe, those studies need to be pushed off a bit. They are within the budget horizon, uh, but they are not immediately in 2025. Um, we continue investments in open source science um, and radioisotope power systems and planetary data system. All right, so this is the same slide I showed you a second ago, but it's got some new text at the bottom. So I grayed out the part I already spoke about. Let's talk about, um, let's come back to this TBD uh, that's in the budget from our sample return. Uh, as I said, when the full budget table is released, you'll see uh, that Mars sample return um, is in there for TBD. Um, and I'm going to attempt to preemptively address what does that mean, TBD? Um, as I said a minute ago, we're trying to give the response team uh, the time they need to complete uh, their assessment and to provide their recommendation. Uh, they will complete their work at the end of March, as we've been stating for a while. Uh, they will do that. And once those recommendations are in hand, the agency leadership uh, are going to make decisions on what the path forward um, looks like, including the funding support for Mars sample return in 2025. And as I said, we will provide, they'll provide uh, an addendum to the proposed budget um, this spring, anticipated this spring, um, to address uh, the elephant in the room, because the question is going to come. Um, I do not expect the top level planetary budget to go up above the 2.73 billion uh, in the 25. So there will be some, we need to think about how we support Mars sample return within the balanced planetary portfolio and within that 2.73 billion top line. Um, that's for 2025. 
as I said, Fiscal Responsibilities Act covers 24 and 25. There is a possibility that there might be a little bit more breathing room in 26 and beyond. So there may be ways to accommodate as we go further out into the funding horizon. Um, but for 25, we know there's gonna be some tough challenges. Um, that said, again, I'm gonna say it again, my goal and Nikki's goal um, is to make sure that however we go forward implementing Mars sample return, um, that we do that within the context of our balanced portfolio, meaning that we will continue uh, to support the diversity of activities in our program. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say about budget. No questions, no, joking. You can ask questions. You know I like questions. Um, so I already said this, uh, New Frontiers uh, is now uh, no earlier than 2026. Um, as I've been saying for a bit, we are, we have asked the uh, National Academies uh, Committee on Astrobiology and Planetary Science, or CAPS, um, to take a look at the target list. Um, and they are considering the list for New Frontiers 5 and New Frontiers 6 um, and as part of their tasking. It's a very broad tasking, and so it's up to them on how they interpret that, and we anticipate hopefully getting some response from them um, in a few months. I'm sure their meeting's coming up next week. I feel certain they will be spending a lot of their agenda um, on discussions of this very topic. Um, all right. Oh, no, let me go back to that one. This is important. This is our decadal survey. I don't have a lot of time here tonight. I only have one thing to say about our decadal survey, and that is this is the single most important guiding document we have for our community. It was assembled by hundreds of your closest friends uh, in the community, <laughs> uh, dozens and dozens of them that came together uh, to put this document together and prioritize what's important for our community. As I said, again, we're in tough times right now. Belts are tight. Um, but we've been through these kinds of things before. Um, even just a decade ago, there was a thing called sequestration that was very, very uh, difficult um, to, to work through. But we get through these things and we will, we will come out on the other side. Um, and the way we're going to come out on the other side is everyone supporting the decadal survey and all the amazing science that it holds. So stand together for planetary science, stand together for NASA science, and stand together for NASA. All right, I'm getting ready to walk off the stage here. Um, just a few uh, shout outs for what's coming up uh, in the coming months. Um, we've got, uh, we've already had the first couple of CLIPS landing. There's gonna be potentially a couple more this year. Joel will tell you what's in store for CLIPS, but what an exciting time for lunar science. Um, like I said, we got Firefly maybe coming up. That's the next one maybe on the agenda. We've got a solar eclipse coming up in uh, in April. And yes, it's called a solar eclipse, but you've all heard me say it before. There's no solar eclipse without the moon. Yes. So we own the moon and, and then earth science always says, but you can't see it unless you're sitting on earth. I, I, anyway, uh, <laughs> all right. Um, and then last on here, I've got Lunar Trailblazer, which is also going to be a ride share on uh, the, in, the next Intuitive Machines launch uh, when they're ready to send up IM2. So a lot of great things to look forward to. Um, as I said, I'm going to uh, just one more shout out to Europa Clipper. Yay, Clipper, we're going to launch in October. And we did um, we did the big reveal of the vault plate last Friday at South by Southwest. Um, and uh, you can go to go.nasa.gov slash make waves and you can listen to every single one of those uh, languages where we say the word water in each one of those languages. And you can read Ada Limon's poem and you can see Ron Greeley's image etched on there and the Drake equation. It's And you can also see the chip that has over 2.6 million names from around the world. So there you go. All right, with that, I'm going to stop and I'm going to hand it over to Lindsay and we're going to kind of round robin here and then we'll take lots of questions at the end. Thank you. Hi. Um, as Lori said, I am Lindsay Hayes. I am not David Grinspoon, um, who is unfortunately unable to make it here tonight. Um, he sends his regards. Um, he had a family emergency. So um, I will be here representing astrobiology and the astrobiology program for you for a few minutes. Um, let's see if I can figure out, there we go. Um, so to start us off, uh, 
we have some new leadership within the astrobiology program. Um, David Grinspoon up there at the top, the senior scientist for astrobiology strategy, um, myself as the program scientist for astrobiology strategy. This is really sort of a partnership that we have. Um, he's really working on the up and out. His role as the new senior scientist for astrobiology strategy is to expand the astrobiology program within NASA and beyond. And my role as a program scientist for astrobiology is the sort of down and in, right? So my role is to manage existing astrobiology research and coordinate nation programs. All of the astrobiology things that you know and love um, are remaining and they're, you know, it's the kind of thing we're working on, but we're also working on expanding and moving beyond. Um, and of course, I also want to highlight, uh, we have a new deputy program scientist for astrobiology. This is Becky McCauley Wrench, um, recently back from parental leave. So we're really excited, uh, the three of us to be working together um, and really uh, moving forward within astrobiology. So a reminder of the astrobiology research programs uh, that you should be familiar with. We'll hear some more about these within the, the overall RNA presentation that we'll hear tomorrow. Um, but the, the four sort of major astrobiology programs, exobiology, which I'm the program officer for, planetary science technology through analog research, PSTAR, Becky is the program officer for, um, ICAR, Interdisciplinary Consortia for Astrobiology Research, um, and Habitable Worlds. Um, this is a quick reminder about what all of those are for, but of course, astrobiology research is also covered um, in Picasso and Matisse in terms of uh, instrument development in Finest. If you're a graduate student and interested in astrobiology research, that's a program that's available to you. Uh, we fund astrobiology research as part of our ISFM, internal scientist funding models, um, as well as TWISCs for conferences and workshops and things, planetary protection research, XRP, other things that are sort of tangential related to, to, to astrobiology. So there's a lot of different programmatic things within astrobiology that are continuing. Um, another reminder, of course, I can actually see my time. Oh, there it is. Okay. The timer is down there, um, which is right behind this. Um, so another thing to remember, of course, are the research coordination network. So I mentioned um, I'm managing both the programmatic aspect as well as the coordination aspect. With the RCNs, a reminder that these are not funding venues. You're not going to go to an RCN and apply um, and get research funding. These are coordination activities. Um, coordination, all of these different ones have more or less um, connection to certain aspects of planetary science. Um, some of them we have in partnership with some of the other divisions within SMD, things like Nexus um, and NOW. Others are sort of entirely within PSD, um, but, but they all have different connections to planetary science. Um, they are led by two or sorry, by three or four co-leads um, and the steering committee members, all of those folks are funded through NASA research. Um, and then there's affiliate memberships and all of the activities that the research coordination networks host um, are available to members of the community. So if some of these are within your research area, I encourage you to look at the websites. All of the websites are listed there um, and see what's going on with these folks and see what activities there are. Um, so these are the slides that are actually David's slides. So I'm going to do my best to represent him uh, to you all tonight. Um, so when David was brought on in his new role for astrobiology strategy, uh, he, was he was tasked with expanding at the astrobiology program within NASA and beyond. So this includes things like increased cross-divisional and cross-directorate activity, um, things like interagency programs, um, uh, revitalized international connections in a post-NAI era, how the astrobiology connection or how, how astrobiology connects with international partners um, is something that he's been working quite a bit on, expanding the role in missions, things not just um, in formulation or in data analysis, but everything in between, um, and sort of the post-discovery planning. There was recently a workshop that just wrapped up that was all about communicating the discovery of life. It was between scientists and journalists, and how do we communicate that, and what are the, you know, what are the ways there'll be an article that'll come out about, there's a journal article that they're working on, so I encourage if that's something you're interested in to look for that pretty soon. Um, Within the first year, he's really focused on increasing cross-divisional and cross-directional activity. So within NASA, um, focusing on thinking about how to how to coordinate things within NASA. Um, Within the different divisions here, you can see EPSCOR, for example, um, is a way to work with NSF and other divisions. Um, it looks to fund research, but sort of outside our traditional RNA portfolio. So it's a great way to get new funding. Um, you can see astrophysics really focuses on exoplanets and habitability and that sort of thing. And then uh, the biological and physical sciences, there'll be a metagenome workshop that'll be coming up hopefully later this year. 
Oops, that's the laser pointer. Um, and finally, um, it has been about a decade since we've had an astrobiology strategy, uh, a new astrobiology strategy document. We've had this one for the past decade. Um, and so this year, uh, we're starting to plan an activity to formulate a new strategy. Um, the decadal has come out. A number of other things have happened within the past decade. Um, and so uh, we're thinking about expanding um, and, and sort of thinking about where we'll go with astrobiology research in the next decade. Um, we had a fantastic Moskersky lecture today that talked about thinking about research and planning on a 10-year but beyond 10-year timescale. And so that's uh, part of this consideration. And I will walk off by saying we have a new uh, uh, NPMP, a NASA Postdoctoral Management Program fellow, who will be coming on. Her name is Rachel Harris. She'll be coming on to help with this activity uh, in May. So thank you very much. No, there's a final. Hey, good evening, everybody. It's great to be here in person. This is a challenging budget year, but a lot of the investments we've made over the past uh, few years are now being realized. And I'm going to talk a bit about what's going on for robotic um, lunar science and ramping up into lunar science to be performed by humans. First, I want to talk about, um, Lori Glaze mentioned that one of the priorities is to infuse decadal level uh, uh, scientific investigations in Artemis. You know, the way we do that is through focused competitions with the community, whether that is for robotically delivered systems using commercial linear payload services, or the science teams, the deployed instruments, handheld instruments that will be used by the crew members that will go to the purpose of the moon. The first, um, and as Jake will I'll tell you, the first um, Artemis three, but the Artemis three flight to the South Pole of the moon is scheduled by NASA for September uh, 2026. So several uh, probably folks in this room have applied for the um, Artemis III deployed instruments call. That is the selections for that are very near, quite imminent, not ready to share with you yet today. But we're also in parallel getting ready to release to the community the draft call for Prism's, what's called the Prism Salsa call, again, to be delivered through CLIPS um, to the lunar surface. This will be for standalone seg agnostic, agnostic instrument as opposed to suites, as we did in Prism 3. Uh, we we um, did this type of announcement in response to informal um, requests from mem various members of the community who wanted to be able to propose single instruments as opposed to large suites to be delivered robotically uh, to the lunar surface. But based on what we've learned from PRISM 3 and also doing the competition for Artemis 3 deployed instruments and framing this individual PRISM Salsa call, we're now taking the steps to plan out the announce the competitive announcements that will take place after that, whether that's the LTV instrument call, the one for the Artemis 4 deployed instruments, and the Artemis 4 handheld uh, instruments coming up. You probably heard today the talk from the principal investigator for the Artemis III geology team. When you add the geology team to the previously announced project scientists for Artemis III and Artemis IV, and then the deployed instruments call, you can see how we are moving competitively to infuse science into the overall Artemis campaign, but also individual missions for Artemis. And in the far term, you'll see us do the same thing as we mature the pre-formulation activities for Endurance A which is Origins, Worlds, and Life um, recommended embodiment of the South Pole uh, Aiken Basin sample return mission. So things have been very fast paced since the beginning of the year. We've had two CLIPS companies make their first landing attempts to go to the lunar surface. First was Astrobotic, launched in January 8th of this year. Uh, Astrobotic found relatively soon after spacecraft activation that they had an anomaly in their main propulsion system, which was going to prevent them from making a landing attempt on the moon with the five instruments that NASA paid them to transport to the moon on their mission, but also for several of the commercial customers that they uh, brought instruments, they were planning to bring instruments to the moon. We found out many things on this flight. First off, we found out that the Vulcan Centaur vehicle on its first flight had a really great performance, and we're looking forward to Vulcan competing to deliver NASA missions in the future as they go through certification of this new Vulcan Centaur vehicle. Astrobotic pivoted uh, since they knew they couldn't make a landing attempt and they exercised their spacecraft. They had the NASA instruments exercised to prove they could be powered on, transfer data, take engineering measurements, try to, uh, they, and they were not gonna go to the surface of the moon. So these are mostly engineering measurements that were taken. 
And then Astro Body collected um, after, after going out to the distance of the moon from the Earth and swinging back to Earth to bring their mission to a close by going through a controlled reentry and disposal of uh, return to Earth. Astrobotic will tell you that they learned a lot about how their spacecraft operated, many of the systems, uh, but not the key propulsion system worked very well from their point of view. As you can imagine, NASA is looking at lessons learned from this and how we plan in the future. Astrobotic right now is conducting a failure review board of what happened on Peregrine Mission 1. And once we have the results of that, NASA will determine what actions we're going to take in the future. For example, both Eclipse missions in general, but ex also in particular, for Astrobotics' next mission, which is slated to deliver Viper, a very large investigation, a very single largest um, uh, instrument that SMD right now is contracted with any Eclipse entity to deliver to the surface of the moon. We will look at their failure review board um, findings and determine what steps we believe we need to take for Viper for the future. This was followed up um, a little more than a month later by the by the attempt of intuitive machines using their first um, clip spacecraft called Odysseus, launched on a Falcon 9. Odysseus um, it, it was the first spacecraft to demonstrate in flight, um, in, in um, transit between the Earth and the Moon or any other bodies, a high ISP liquid methane, liquid oxygen cryogenic propulsion system, which worked extremely well. They uh, were able to go um, into lunar orbit uh, probably about um, six, seven days or so after lunch from Earth. They then um, descended to the lunar surface. Right before descending, they found out they had a problem that their um, laser altimeters were hard commanded off and they could not recommend them open by software. They reported that they would attempt to use data from the navigation Doppler LIDAR NASA um, provided payload for this mission, one of the payloads that we had paid for them to take to the surface of the moon. They then executed their descent. And at the point that they made contact with the lunar surface, they could not report in the beginning that they had calm. They wondered, um, because it looked like the vehicle was following the trajectory well, they knew they had to do a clocking maneuver to orient the high gain antenna to Earth. They found out after days and days of of trying to improve the communications once they made contact with the vehicle on the ground, that it wasn't just that the spacecraft was clocked at a different angular location, but that the spacecraft was actually tilted lying on the side of the moon. They, After they were able to reestablish um, higher blood rate communications, they were able to bring down data from the spacecraft. They were able to bring down images which verified that the spacecraft was sitting on the side. And they were even to bring down one image that shows that the spacecraft um, during descent right above the surface came down a little too um, fast over their one meter per second descent target to about three meters per second, but also some lateral velocity. And they have photographic evidence here that they have a dam at least one damaged lander leg, which is what led to the spacecraft tilting on its side. And it also landed on a 12 degree slope, which they was not their target for their slope. They realized backing through all their data that what had happened was that they had tried to slave the NASA, the navigation Doppler leader information into their GNNC, but it turned out their GNC rejected it. So they actually flew to the surface using their inertial measurement unit, plus calculations of altitude that their computer did as a backup using optical images from their hazard avoidance system. And they were still able to get, unfortunately it didn't calculate exactly the right altitude, but they were still able to get roughly to the location they were trying to get rough down, uh, reducing from about 1800 meters per second starting velocity down to three meters per second instead of one meter per second. So intuitive machines, and we believe that given the very um, limited um, criteria we used for the, um, for the initial, uh, what are called task order two clips landings, that they made great progress. I mean, intuitive machines, they've been quoted as saying it's an unqualified success. We believe it was a really, really great progress, a great demonstration that was done, and doing what they did proved that it, we believe that it is an existence proof that it's possible to make the CLIPS model function, that you can actually go out and buy a service of bringing cargo to the moon for a relatively low price point and have a commercial company bring your equipment down to the moon. The mission did not proceed the way they or we had anticipated, um, but they are uh, very emboldened, I think, from this. Right now, they're doing their lessons learned. They're doing their mission reconstruction, going back through all their data in detail to determine what it is they think they need to improve before their next mission, which is tentatively scheduled for the end of this year to go to Shackled and Connecting Ridge, actually for some space technology mission directorate investigations. 
And that leads us to where we are today, still for uh, using clips for erotic lunar science delivery. We have a large number of deliveries we've already competed. The ones that have landers and have company and have company names listed here are the ones where NASA's not only have the science instruments defined, but the landers are competed. The ones without icons are ones where uh, we have picked the scientific investigations through PRISM or through international investigations or contributions from other mission directorates or instruments we picked in years by that did not land. For example, um, for our Maston's mission, which was canceled because Maston went into financial difficulty. And we're still on the track, as Lori Glaze said, of to competing for two new missions every year, one PRISM call every year. And we will progress indefinitely into the future to show that the, first that this model will work and then to have a recurring way to have decadal level science infused into robotic lunar commercially um, originated missions. Let me turn over um, now to um, Jake Bleacher from ESDMD. Right. Good evening, everybody. It's uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, unlike Lori, I uh, did not load up my first ever slide at LPSC, um, but I can say that I remember presenting at Gilruth, and I can remember presenting actual slides. So, at least put into context uh, when I got started. Um, but it does always feel uh, like coming home uh, to come back to LPSC. Kind of grew up here. I'm sure. Sarah feels very similar, uh, many familiar faces, and I don't always see all my uh, familiar scientist faces anymore. Uh, now that I work for the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate, I go to a, a suite of other meetings uh, to represent science and represent the science that our Science Mission Directorate is uh, is working with us to, to accomplish as we explore the moon and onto Mars. I do want to note, um, I was going thinking about asking people to raise their hands, but I decided not to. But um, it's nice to see that there are a lot of early career folks here, right? The people who are going to pick up the work that we're doing now and, uh, and carry it to even greater lengths away from the Earth as we build this blueprint for exploration, as our management speaks about. I do also like to note that um, if you're 23 years old or younger, does anyone know what the significance of that number is? If you're 23 years old or younger, you don't know what it's like to live on a planet that doesn't have people living in space. So we have had people living on the International Space Station for 23 years. And it strikes me that we are also at the cusp of laying the groundwork to maybe look at future generations and say, Folks that are 20 something years old and younger don't know what it's like to live on an earth that doesn't have people living on the moon or maybe on Mars at some point. So it's wonderful to start thinking about the excitement of what we're doing. Now I mentioned conferences I go to nowadays. Um, a few weeks ago, I was at something called the Artemis Suppliers Conference. If you look at the pictures here, you've seen these slides from us before showing the different programs and elements that make up our Artemis architecture. Uh, well, each of these includes major contractors, what we call our prime contractors, and they hold a conference where they get together. And it used to be only the ones on the left uh, that have actual pictures representing them right now. Uh, but this year, we actually had all of the prime contractors for the first time, and it was quite a, quite a sight to see. So I was there uh, as an advocate for science. And we talk about our three pillars that hold up exploration. We refer to inspiration, we refer to national posture, and the third of the, those pillars is science. So I want to drive home the point that, the, the, that NASA acknowledges the importance of science. It is core to holding up our drive for exploration. And what I actually challenged the contractors at, uh, at the suppliers conference to do was to not only be advocates for inspiration and national posture, but they must develop healthy teams that are advocates for science. That is the third pillar. And when I said healthy, what I meant was, and I told them I didn't mean budget, what I mean is that your team should acknowledge and understand their part in the historic place that we are right now. And I think all of you should acknowledge that because the science we do at the moon, at Mars, maybe everywhere, okay? All of the science, the inner solar system, the outer solar system, it's all part of us understanding more about ourselves. 
And as we go out to do the science, we learn. I like to tell those folks that the science is our toolbox for survival. It's not just a thing somebody else does somewhere else in the architecture. It's a thing that we have to wrap our architecture around to go learn more so we can do more, so we can go farther. Now, we have completed a few missions. Um, we've come, as you heard from Joel, we're learning through clips. Um, we also flew our Artemis I uh, mission. So we have collected data uh, flying the Orion spacecraft into space. We learned from the SLS and our exploration ground systems about how to do these missions, which puts us in a position to fly Artemis II, which would be our first flight with astronauts. Um, we did uh, update our schedule to this to be September 2025 uh, because we need to make sure that we understand the information we gained from Artemis I. And I want to be very clear, we will fly our missions when we are very certain that our astronauts will be safe. Those are our friends, they're our family, they're our colleagues, and we're going to fly safe missions with them. Just a few pictures quickly. You probably have recognized uh, the Artemis II crew that was announced. Um, probably some of you have actually worked with a few of these. Christina actually worked at Goddard for a part of her career. So these are our, again, I refer to them as our friends, our family, right? They're not astronauts who are separate people. Putting ourselves in a position to fly Artemis III, which would be astronauts landing on the moon. This mission is now updated to fly in September of 2026. Again, we need to make sure we have time to understand the data that comes back from Artemis II because landing on the moon is another big first for us. And we need to do it safely. Just wanted to show a few pictures of hardware and tests that are um, being conducted right now. We're building Artemis III as we speak. Two more quick slides, Eileen, and then I'll get out of the way. Um, that's focusing on the near term, but focusing on the longer term strategy is another effort that we have underway. We've spent uh, much of the last two to three years working with the community outside of NASA and our international partners uh, to understand what are the objectives. So to the point that science is important, we're actually asking the question, why, first. We're not trying to say, here's the thing you're going to use, tell me what you can do with it. We'd like to say, what do you want to do so we can go build those things that enable it to happen? If you're not familiar with this, I would suggest that you go look at it. The agency holds uh, these Moon to Mars objectives. Um, they're held at the top level. Our job in the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate is to develop the strategy to go achieve it. A few words to be familiar with. Uh, we're dividing up our plan into what we call segments. Human lunar return is what we're doing right now. The first step is flying our new systems to the moon, testing them out, knowing that we can land and return our astronauts safely. We'll then proceed through ever increasing um, capabilities, foundational exploration, which is an expansion of our capabilities across the lunar surface and ability to move farther, eventually sustained lunar evolution, where we really start building with partners uh, what that architecture looks like. And I wanna point out off to the right, humans to Mars is the fourth segment. So as Lori was talking about, Mars samples, I mean, I, I want to be very clear that Exploration System stands with our Science Mission Directorate. It's vital for us to learn as much as we can about Mars as we prepare to go there. And this is, I'm sorry, Eileen, it was three. This is the video and then I'm done. Um, so I would encourage you to take a look at the QR code, this Moon to Mars architecture has documentation we're releasing on a, a, on a yearly cycle now called the Architecture Definition Document. It's a snapshot of where we stand with our strategic planning. Publicly available documents showing transparency and connectivity between objectives and the decisions that we're making in partnership with all of our directorates. We'll kind of finish here with this part of the video. I like to refer to this as our neighborhood. Just like you know your neighborhood, right? the best places, the, the best deli, the place you go watch movies. This is our neighborhood. This is where we're going to learn about living away from the earth. This is where we'll have to learn where the water's at, where the regolith has the right properties for us to put the elements we wanna place down. These names might be names you're not familiar with, or you might be very familiar with them. Very soon, they're gonna become places that you are familiar with because we'll have data. That's the goal for our Artemis architecture. And again, 
Inspiration and national posture are two of the legs, but science is that third pillar upon which our exploration stands. And with that, I'll hand over to Sarah. All right, let's see if I can make this work. Excellent. Hey, hello, everybody. Uh, so a um, few words about Artemis science. Uh, so uh, we were asked in the decadal to, to provide a lunar strategy that also included human exploration as part of, of our overall lunar strategy. We put out a, a draft of that uh, in November. We asked for some community comment. We got fantastic response. Uh, thank you all to those of you who, who submitted community comments. Uh, we are working our way through those comments, but we really do appreciate uh, all of the feedback, uh, and we're hoping to get that out in a final version uh, later this spring, maybe early summer. Uh, so, you know, Jake and I, our mantra the last couple of years have been like Artemis, like, guys, it's getting real. And like, we are now past that point in science. We are now actually the place where it is real, where we're moving from developing a strategy into actual execution. You can really see that in, in Artemis too. As Jake said, the, the date has slipped out a little bit, but our work has not slowed down at all. We are, we are in the midst of developing the science objectives for Artemis too. Uh, we, we actually had a lunar surface science workshop in December to try to get some input from the community on what we want to do in terms of observations from orbit. That has lead, is leading directly into some of our objectives as we work through those for Artemis II. Uh, we're in the midst of, of building a science evaluation room, the science uh, back room, as it was called in Apollo, uh, in Mission Control in Houston. We actually, uh, it is this, this photo here, is, is the room that it is, or at least part of this, is, is what it looked like in Apollo. It was actually where some of the computers were stored during Apollo, but uh, we are just about to break ground and start construction on, on building that into a room for, for our science team to use, um, which will hopefully be ready in time. Well, we expect it to be ready in time for Artemis II. Uh, so we'll get our first chance to use that. Uh, we actually have our, our science officers for Artemis II. Those are the folks who will be in the front room, uh, actually starting their training now to get them ready uh, for Artemis II. We've got, uh, we've, we've, we've trained our astronauts. So, so Jake just showed you the picture of the Artemis II crew. We actually last year had them, uh, oops, now I've, got, now I've done it. There we go. We actually uh, were able to provide them uh, lunar science training, so they are ready to, to go out and talk to the, to the world about what it, what it means to go to back to the moon and, and why the science is important. So I think that's really fantastic. They were all great students. Uh, we've even had a couple chances to get, to get some of them out into the field. We'll have more chances to get them out into the field as well so that they really understand the geology, which is fantastic. Uh, and in really every aspect of Artemis II, we are using it to help prepare for Artemis III, right? So developing the science evaluation room, learning how to integrate lunar science into Artemis missions and operations, understanding these orbital observations, where does that data go? How do we get that data back? All of those questions that we're going to have to answer for Artemis III, we are using Artemis II to really buy down uh, all of those questions. Artemis III, we are also starting execution. Just two weeks ago, we had our first Artemis III science team meeting at, here in Houston. It was fantastic. Uh, and as, as Joel mentioned, we are very soon going to add those deployed instruments teams to that. So we'll be able to fill out our Artemis III science team and, and really start uh, making progress on, on getting ready for that mission. We got all sorts of stuff going on. And we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to get involved in Artemis. Uh, you know, when we start talking about Artemis, it is not a thing that NASA is doing. The Artemis science is a thing that we, as a science community, are doing together. And so we need all of you. We really need the entire community to help us out uh, and make sure that we can do this. Uh, and there are plenty of ways to do that. So we've got a ton of calls coming out. Joel talked about a couple of them. We've got a new lunar mapping program call coming out. Uh, proposals due this summer. Uh, we're going to do another analog activities call for, um, for getting us help to, to understand how operations work. Uh, those calls, by the way, are open to senior grad students, senior advanced grad students. Uh, so please take a look in, in ROSES and see if that's something you want to get involved in. Uh, we've got the Participating Scientists Program to add a few more scientists to our Artemis III science team. Uh, Artemis IV deployed instruments, Artemis IV handheld instruments. We're looking to get uh, instruments for lunar terrain vehicles. There are all things, all sorts of, of calls happening. Uh, we don't just need people to submit to these calls. We are also going to need people to help review them. And I want to encourage and remind you that, that doing that is also a way to contribute to Artemis and is also really important. 
Uh, we have uh, plenty of opportunities for, to provide input through the Lunar Surface Science Workshop series, which are free and, and entirely virtual. Uh, and again, I want to impress upon you how important the input from the community has been through those Lunar Surface Science Workshops. We have a league and XMEG uh, inputs. Right now, they're working on a joint SAT on samples, and there was actually a town hall, I think, this morning. Um, that, that was uh, starting to get community input on that. So please pay attention to those things and contribute where you can. Uh, we are looking to get to working, uh, talking to the National Academies about an upcoming study looking at uh, the science that we can do with humans uh, outside of just the, the South Pole and what, where, where we really need humans on the surface and what kind of science that we can accomplish that way. So keeping your eye out for that. One last slide. Uh, I do want to point out, we do again have these lunar surface science workshops. We had a few great ones last year. I want to point out, we were not, Jake and I were not able to do an Artemis Town Hall here this year, but if you want some more detailed uh, information about Artemis, we do about sort of annually, we do these updates from headquarters. Please tune in, uh, listen to what's going on, uh, and, and figure out how you can participate. And I think that is my last slide, yes. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we now will be uh, taking uh, questions from the floor. Uh, the The process that I'm gonna go through is I will go and uh, um, rotate through the different ballrooms that we have here today. As you come up to the mic to ask questions, please state your name and affiliation. And as people are coming up, I also want to uh, uh, have a quick reminder to the community to remain professional. Is this on? Yes, hi. Okay, hi, Amanda Hendricks, Planetary Science Institute. My question is for Lori, and it is about MSR budgets for FY24 and FY25. Mm -hmm. Let's see, my understanding is that for FY24, MSR could be anywhere between 300 and 949 million. That is the language in the appropriations bill. That's what it says, that uh, we must spend at least 300. We are allowed to spend up to the 949 number. And then once the Merck report comes out, mm -hmm. then you'll decide how much. Exactly, yeah. but keeping in mind, that the top level of our budget is fixed right. at the 2.71 and that the balance within our portfolio is paramount. Yep, great. But similar question for FY25 <clears throat> because I just, I haven't dug into the uh, PBR mm -hmm. fully yet, but a quick addition mm -hmm. showed that what's left over from the line items that were there was about 900 million, which I thought might be the amount up to which MSR might. I'm sorry, I'm not understanding your question. Say it again. Uh, the In 25, the yeah. 25 budget, which is a top level of 2.73. Exactly. Yes. And there were some line items in there for different, um, mm -hmm. different things. And it looked to me like when I added those up, they didn't add up to 2.7. So it does add up to 2.7. There is nothing okay. unaccounted for in that budget. It all adds up to 2.7. How much is how much is allocated for MSR? Then? TBD. So anything that has a dollar amount allocated to it will get cut. Some amount. This is what is going to be yeah. part of our very difficult process okay. that once we have the outcome of the MERT and the agency leadership has an opportunity to determine what the appropriate path forward is mm -hmm. within the balanced portfolio, within Planetary Science Division, what is the appropriate level? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, question from Waterway 5. Hi, this is uh, David Minton from Purdue University. I just want to, first of all, thank everybody here from NASA. Um, I just feel very privileged to be able to do the things that I do, uh, thanks to um, your hard work in the agency. So um, we'll all get through the, the budget crisis together. Um, actually, my question is uh, about the Artemis program, and particularly Artemis 3. 
So, so much of Artemis three is resting on the success of Starship and this, you know, in, in flight refueling that's never been done before. So it's a, it, it feels to me like a, like a big risk um, that uh, could go either way this year, depending on how things are going. And I, I, I know I've been following the Starship program. There's been a lot of delays, you know, with the FAA getting uh, you know, flight waivers. Um, and so this is a very ambitious schedule uh, to be. So uh, is there an evaluation of the, the risk of actually pulling this off in the next couple of years? Because that that's, seems a really short time scale. Yeah, thank you for the question. And, and that's a good one. And the first thing I will say is that space flight is risky. Uh, there is simply no way around that. Um, we are pushing the boundaries um, that have not been pushed before. Uh, I will also say that we are constantly evaluating schedule and um, testing along with the contractors who we're working with. Uh, earlier this year, we updated our schedule based on uh, our understanding of where we stood. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the number one most important thing to us is the safety of our friends who will be sitting uh, in the Orion capsule. Um, so I 100% hear the points that you're making, and I agree with you. Um, we have a lot to do, but we are constantly evaluating that with our partners. And as I mentioned already, we will let you know uh, if there are changes to that. Um, but we are working through this. We, I, I'm, you know, to be very clear, if we are going to build a blueprint for exploring space and having human beings going to destinations farther away from the earth, we have to figure out these steps. We have to figure out the steps that our contractors are challenged to do right now. Um, and so, you, you know, my bosses, when you hear them in public, they talk about this hurdle is the hurdle that we have to overcome. And so we are challenged to do so and we will do it. Um, so we'll update you as we go. We will evaluate, we will test, and we will model as we go until we're ready to fly a successful mission. Okay, a question from Waterway 6. Uh, Steve Ruff, Arizona State University. Jake, um, sorry, this is somewhat redundant, but I'll ask it more directly. Is there, a re is there a required demonstration of Starship landing on the moon before Artemis 3 goes? SpaceX will land on the moon with a demo lander before we put crew on board. So the answer is yes. Yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, question from Waterway 4. Uh, yeah, Ben Greenhagen, APL. So I have a question about Endurance A. Uh, Endurance A was a uh, decadal priority, even for the constrained budget scenarios, uh, but I didn't really see anything about it today. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit about what the plans are both this year and next year moving forward for that? Yeah, so for this year and going into next year, we're gonna charter a community science definition team to go look at the strategic research topics and the specific um, Endurance A designated science objectives and origins, worlds and life, and compare them also to the instrument set, which is most appropriate to be tagged to Endurance A. We're also investing in a couple of particular technology that we think need to be further matured before we can actually go into formulation for the mission. One has to do with high, relatively high average speed driving and the other autonomy related to driving. And you would think that there's a lot of investment on earth about autonomy related to driving, but not to drive around on the far side or the South Pole of the moon. So it's a little bit unique. So those are the steps that we're taking uh, right now. As we make progress on those from the science definition team, as it comes up with its findings and we're able to show these technologies mature, then we can move more into a formal formulation activity for the mission. Thank you. Okay, we just got one on uh, the Zoom channel. Uh, this one's for Lori. Do you anticipate that NASA's support of ESA's Rosalind Franklin rover might eventually also include a participating scientist program? That's an excellent question. Um, that's typically what we try and do when we're um, cooperating with our international partners on missions. Um, I'm looking at, at Eric for the moment, and he's giving me a thumbs up saying that that's definitely in the plan. Um, we, of course, have had a participation with ESA on Rosalind Franklin from the beginning with the MoMA instrument. So we've, we've had that collaboration from the get-go. Uh, we've just expanded our participation um, to assure that this mission actually gets off the ground um, following the 
the invasion of Ukraine and the decision by ESA to uh, to not use the Russian participation. Okay, a uh, question from Waterway 5. Hi, Alicia Jyoti, UCLA. Um, I'm also involved with the Luna Next Gen Early Career Group. So I have a question for Sarah Noble. Actually, two questions for Sarah. <laughs> Um, so I was very excited to see that uh, you have some opportunities for senior graduate students to get involved in the Artemis program. Um, I'm wondering for your analog activities call, um, do you plan to open this up to foreign nationals um, at US institutions in the future? And also, will you plan to have uh, other graduate student collaboration uh, opportunities for Artemis? Uh, so the reason for the uh, restriction on foreign nationals is because we are again using the, the the science back room and trying to learn how to do it, and it requires us to use a lot of technology and things that that it turns out it's just real difficult to to get foreign nationals access to on the timeline of those calls. So at the moment, this year's call is not, and I don't foresee a point at which we will be able to do that. But we are uh, cognizant that that is a problem, and we are trying to find. Other opportunities, uh, certainly for grad students. The the mapping call is open to foreign national because we don't have any technology problem there. I'm happy to take mappers <laughs> from any nationality. Um, in terms of of graduate students, I mean, as I said, right, it's going to take the it's going to take the whole community. We are specifically looking to grow some of our some of our communities, and particularly the sample science community, the mapping community, the field and operations communities. And so you, we have a lot of calls targeted to those guys. I, I hope that you can see opportunities for grad students in there. Um, when I mentioned that we are looking for reviewers, we will also be looking for executive secretaries for those panels. And so that is a fantastic way. Uh, for grad students to, to get involved and to learn how to write proposals. So I do hope you will uh, take those things into consideration. Okay, another question from Waterway 4. Uh, yeah, thank you. This one's for Lori as well. Um, uh, Donnie Glazer, MPP at NASA GIS. Um, so I appreciate that you guys had to make some really difficult decisions for, for 24 and pushing back uh, MSR. So I was wondering um, how you maintain those like big, you know, flagship missions, uh, MSR, uh, Hab Worlds, those sort of things um, it, without, you know, any sort of major, major delays like we saw with JWST and those sorts of things that, yeah, yeah understanding that, you know, a year or two might not kill the mission, but if this goes on decades, then it that poses significant science issues. Yeah, so it's a really good question. Um, and again, we come back to there's a couple of, of pieces here to this question, and and one of them is how do we how do we execute within the balanced portfolio so that we're not spending too much. And we have guidelines from the decadal surveys, very clear to try not to spend more than 35% of the planetary budget in any program year. So we need to try and work within that guideline. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons, you know, James Webb um, actually, you know, spread things out. So they didn't have large expenditures in any one program year, but that means a much longer development cycle. So I can tell you, I'm, I'm confident that the response team, the, the MSR IRB response team are looking at, you know, the overall timeline and trying to understand how can we execute in a, in a reasonable amount of time and what kind of funding is required and how do we keep that within a balanced portfolio. So, you know, let's let's let the the response team do their job, let them complete, um, and then we'll see what the recommendation is that comes out. But I, I think all of those things are are kind of top of mind for the the entire team. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I have another question. The newest roses call does not include participating scientist proposal options for either Mars Science Laboratory or the Mars twenty twenty missions. What is the status and timing? of upcoming participating scientist opportunities, either continuing with the existing class of members or current reduced funding or requiring new proposals? Thank you, Eileen. That's a great question. I think that one came in through our IO thing. And I think that um, I'm going to ask Delia Santiago Matares, who's our lead for the RNA program, um, to provide us with a response for that one. Right now, there are no plans to fund Mars 2020 or MSL PSPs um, beyond what's already being 
supported. Um, specifically for Mars 2020, um, those investigators are um, expected to finish up their award within one no-cost extension of their existing period of performance. Um, it is possible there could be more PSP um, support in the future, but that's really going to depend on mission needs and funding availability. Thanks, Delia. Okay, next question for from Waterway 5. Um, Simon Stiller from ETH Zurich, a question to Dave and Lori. Um, you mentioned that Starship's are uh, going to be crew rated until 26 and uh, will demonstrate multiple landings on the moon, hopefully, until then. Will that mean that Starship is then also an acceptable launch vehicle for NF5 or the next Discovery calls? <laughs> and is NASA working on a process actually to define what that means in terms of uh, mass or uh, payload fairing diameter? So it's a really good question. And right now, I think it's a little premature to say what, what uh, kind of launch vehicle capabilities are going to be available in New Frontier 6 or the New Frontiers 5, sorry, the next, uh, uh, what am I? Yes, New Frontiers 5, the next call, uh, which right now we're thinking is is uh, going to be no earlier than 2026. So we'll see kind of what the lay of the land, uh, how it evolves between now and then. Um, at, we don't actually, um, you can't actually propose to a specific launch vehicle. Uh, what we do is we would uh, provide launch capabilities that you're allowed to consider. Um, and then uh, whatever is available on the launch service provider contract is is what uh, we would uh, at the appropriate time uh, do a procurement for the specific launch vehicle. But I think at this point, like I said, it's a little premature to guess what's going to be in that AO. We've got to see what happens between now and then. Okay, next question from Waterway 6. Hi, uh, Denise Buckner, University of Florida. My question is for Lori. I know you mentioned that the earliest the discovery might be recompeted again is going to be in 26. I was wondering, um, first of all, when you might have an estimate on whether or not it will actually be open then. Mm -hmm. And I was also wondering if you anticipate that there may be an increase in the amount of funds available for when that is competed, uh, considering it's going to be a few years out. So let me just say that at this point, um, we've got a, a bunch of constraints in the budget. One of the few knobs that we have for being able to address some of the near-term budget concerns is to, to kind of delay some of the opportunities. Um, we were right on the verge of releasing the New Frontiers 5 call, and so that's why we're, we're, we're thinking about that one. Um, in the 26 time frame, it's possible the others may either come before or maybe after. We're still kind of looking at that. We need to, as we go through the 2026 budget process, which, you know, as if it's not enough that we have a 24 and a 25, we're actually starting to work on 26 right now. So as we go through that, we'll start to see what things look like and where we think we can dovetail the various opportunities. And at the soonest opportunity we have that we can communicate kind of the timing of when those different calls is going to be, we'll make sure we let the community know. Yeah, but we need to we need to understand what things look like after 25 at this point. And I can't, I don't remember if I said it earlier. I did say, I, I meant, if I didn't, I meant to say that the constraints from the Fiscal Responsibilities Act um, are, are limited to 2024 and 2025. And so as we go through the 26 and 27 budget planning processes, um, you know, there is potential opportunity for a little more breathing room in the budget. So we'll see kind of how that plays out. Did I answer your question fully? Um, yeah, I was just wondering also if you expect that there may be a, a higher amount of funding available for those proposals when it does get released, if it is a few years out. So for New Frontiers, um, we're hoping to provide some more guidance on that once we get the responses back from uh, National Academies on the targets um, so that we can let people know for their planning uh, where what we anticipate. Um, and then, you know, for the next discovery calls, again, we've got guidance from Decadal Survey. We have other um, uh, other data that we have in hand on those various programs as we and thinking about inflation and and various other parameters. So you know we will provide that guidance as we as we get closer to the calls. I can, if I tell you a number now, it's going to change by the time the call comes mm -hmm. out. So we'll we'll try to provide better information when we get closer. Okay, next question from Waterway Four. 
Hi, Lori. I think this one's probably for you, but um, I'll shank it up. Yeah. I was a little surprised that you didn't, or, or so, nobody mentioned the new change in no cost extension uh, enforcement policy mm. that was announced at PAC last yeah. week for the first time. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that because most of the people I've talked to were completely unaware of it. And some people, I think you can guess who, were seriously damaged by that policy change. Okay. Um, I am going to let Delia take that one as well. She's the one that spoke about it at the PAC meeting. Um, and so Delia, why don't you take that? You're, you're closest to that one. Yes. So we understand it's impacting people and it is a very serious situation. Um, and for those who are not aware, the NSFC, which administers grants, has started strictly enforcing an existing rule, which is that you have to request your note cost extension for your award um, within 60 and 10 days before the end of the period performance. Um, and so that's been a rule for a long time, but they've changed enforcing it um, where even missing it by a day is leading to the award ending. And you could have $100,000 in your award and it will end. Um, we do not have control of that, unfortunately. Um, that is something that we just don't have control of. Um, we are going to be talking about the RNA town hall to make sure everyone knows, to please check your emails about when those, you know, those requests are due. Um, because we really don't want to see this, you know, anybody's research dollars wasted. It's it's painful for everyone. So we're going to be, at, you know, talking about it at this meeting, really getting everybody, you know, on board with that. Um, and um, we're, it, it's a, it's a tough situation, but it's something that's, they enforce and we don't really have a lot of control over that. So. Yes, I, I want to emphasize that I do not disagree with the policy. Mm -hmm. We do need to be obedient to the deadlines, but the enforcement policy was changed in an underhanded and devious manner that cost people money and, and it was really very upsetting. I, I understand. Um, and as no warning, I, I understand. And that's not a, that's not something that that PSD has control over. Michael knew. I don't know if you want to say anything about NSSC and their enforcement of the existing policy. Because this is this impacts much more than just planetary science. Yeah, um, I don't think they told us they were going to start enforcing it strictly either. Um, there's been a sea change in the procurement office at NASA, and all sorts of things that we used to do that maybe we shouldn't have been doing are now being made much much more difficult. They're doing audits of things. Um, I apologize that this happened, but as I said, I don't think they even told us they were going to start doing it. They just started doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So seriously, our apologies to anyone who, who has been negatively impacted. Sandra. Yeah. So Sandra Connolly, I'm the deputy AA for science at NASA. And so um, I hear the concerns and, you know, I think we have a really good partnership with our colleagues across NASA and certainly making sure that we carry these concerns back to our um, grants management organization and procurement organization so that as they're making changes moving forward that they can communicate with us the so that we better understand the impacts to you. So that's an action we can take. It doesn't really help where you are right now, but certainly we can be very overt with our conversations with them and understand what might be on the horizon so that we can share earlier. Thank you, Sandra. Okay, question from Waterway 5. I think this is five, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go for it. You're on camera. I've been standing so long, I can't remember what I was going to ask. Go for it, Mark. <laughs> uh, it's Mark Robinson, Arizona State University. I think this is for Jake. So, you know, you can sit down. Um, I didn't. Thanks. Yeah. I, I didn't. I might have fallen asleep for a few minutes, but I didn't hear anything in there about status of gateway and. Um, <laughs> if it's still part of the critical path for Artemis three and, you know, going forward, or is it morphed into something else? Yeah. Gateway is not part of Artemis three. Uh, the requirements for Artemis three were to reach lunar orbit and then go to the surface. Um, but it is a part of the overall architecture and plan. Um, like all the systems we're developing, we're working, you know, similar to the earlier question about the landers uh, for Artemis three. 
you know, we're working with all of the contractors who are providing the elements to uh, monitor and understand um, their progress and make sure that they're ready to fly and we'll fly them when they're ready. But yes, it is a part of the architecture. It's just not a part of Artemis 3. Oh, so it definitely, well, uh, <clears throat> Artemis 3 will definitely not go to Gateway. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Waterway 4. Hi, um, Cynthia Phillips, JBL, Lori, sorry, I'm making you stand back up again. Uh, so I have a question about- I'll do uh, this all night. Keep going. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so I have a question. I just wanted to clarify a little more about the New Frontiers target list. So you mentioned that CAPS was given a statement of tasks to look at the New Frontiers 5 versus 6 list. Mm -hmm. um, the 6 list was, you know, obviously came from the latest decadal survey. And so the cost cap for mm -hmm. those missions as they were kind of conceptualized was quite a bit higher, more like $1.6 billion. Was CAPS given a task to look at the budget that would be required if they chose to expand or change the target list, or are they just looking at the science targets? So the, the tasking is pretty broad, um, and they have the ability to bring into consideration any aspects that they want to bring into that consideration. They know what is in the decadal survey. They know what those constraints are. They... Um, you know, they also know what the decadal survey says about the number of targets that ought to be offered in any particular call. So there's a lot of guidance in the decadal survey. Uh, our CAPS committee, uh, Committee on Astrobiology and Planetary Science, you know, their role is to be the, um, you know, the the keepers of the decadal survey. Um, and so they will rely heavily on what's in their in the survey as they do their assessment. So. Uh, like I said, I we give them the task. Please help us and provide guidance on what you think we should offer in the next call. And they've got that broad broad band-aid. And what's our expectation of when we'll hear kind of their report on this? Um, so they will be, uh, as I said, probably debating uh, at this coming meeting. They may even have a couple more presentations coming. I haven't actually seen the whole final agenda yet for the coming meeting uh, next week. Um, and then they'll, they've got quite a few closed sessions, which I expect will be working on that uh, report. So my hope is that within a couple of months after the meeting, maybe this summer sometime, perhaps, uh, we should have some, some feedback. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. The idea is to have feedback from the National Academies with plenty of time um, for us to be able to communicate out to the planetary science community what the plans are for uh, New Frontiers 5. Mm -hmm. Okay, the satellite ballrooms have emptied and there's no new uh, Zoom questions. And so we'll continue here. Uh, this is a question for Sarah. All right. <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> uh, so Jennifer Scully, JPL, um, you showed a great slide about upcoming Artemis calls. And I'm wondering if they were roughly in like order of when you're expecting to solicit them. And in particular, <laughs> I'm excited about the participating scientist Artemis 3 call. I'm most interested in that one. Yeah, um, they were sort of, yes, rough, roughly in <laughs> chronological order, but not exactly because we haven't exactly figured out the, the dates of all those calls, including the participating scientist program. I, I am trying to read the tea leaves about about when when is the best time to, to bring those folks on. And so we have not um, we have not determined when that call will be released, but we'll make sure everybody knows about it when it is. Cool. Thank yeah. you. This is for Laura. Um, Tejian from University of Bakisakli, uh, but actually I'm a Chinese student. I'm really happy to see there's a possibility that NASA can work with the Chang 5 sample. Yes. And uh, I hope uh, this is not a stupid question. Um, is it possible in the near future for the Chinese scientists that they can apply the Apollo mission sample or the band sample or the, in the future for the Mars return sample? Thank you. It's a good question. Um, it's my understanding that um, anyone can apply for samples. The challenges that we've had in the past is the ability to actually do a loan agreement. Um, and right now, I don't think that's covered under the current exception, but um, we're taking one step at a time here. So I understand your question. I think it's an excellent question and we're, we'll see where this goes. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Hi, Laurie. Paul Byrne, hey, uh, I've got two questions, and then I've got a comment for the room, but I'm going to start with my questions, both for you. First, for New Frontiers, whatever the next number is going to be, um, no earlier than 26. Is that the draft or the final? And if it's the final, right. is there an anticipation that at some point before then there'll be a list and a dollar amount? Yes. Um, so the, the anticipation is that that would be the final AO in 26, the actual AO. 
in 26, probably towards the end of 26, um, if I had to guess. Um, and so if you recall, when we first embarked on New Frontiers 5, we actually put out a draft, um, I think almost two years in advance, um, to give people plenty of time, or at least I guess community announcements, and then the draft was one year in advance. Let me back up. But we put a community announcement out, I think, um, well over a year, maybe almost two years in advance. So that's why we really are hoping to get the feedback from national academies sometime soon so that we do have a long runway to provide additional community announcements for folks so they can know what the major parameters are and also um, provide that runway to get the draft AO out um, again, hopefully well, well in advance of the final AO. So that is the intent. Um, as I said, we're, we're kind of waiting to see what we get back or when we get back from the national academies and that'll kind of guide the next steps. Okay. For for MSR, um, can you talk again just briefly? You did at the beginning. Mm -hmm. When might we expect to hear the response team's response? Yes. And how long after that before we have a sense of what the dollar amounts are needed, much less how you'll implement them for the mm -hmm. at least through FY25? Yeah, and, and I apologize that it, it maybe sounds a little vague, right? But um at this point we're you know we're working on this as we go. Uh, the MERT uh I know it's a terrible acronym, MERT, um, is uh, uh, they will complete their work and provide their recommendations by the end of March, which is on schedule, as we've been saying for a while. Um, the, that recommendation will go to agency leadership before it's made public. Um, and so there will be some deliberation among the leadership, um, making sure we have buy-in from all the appropriate um, entities um, as far as what the, the proposed plan is for implementation. Um, I don't expect that to take terribly long. Um, we do need to get that uh, amended uh, proposal, uh, proposed budget for 25. That needs to be completed fairly quickly. So I, what we've committed to, um, I think in the statements that were made earlier today is in the spring to have that, have a little more clarity. And we do intend to make the MERT report public when everything is complete. Thank you. Sandra, and did I cover that appropriately? Okay. And before I finish, I think a lot of you know that I, I'm pro Venus and that in the past I have criticized, I think rightly, Mars not return because the things of the IRB two pointed out. But I will say this, NASA has the opportunity now to put it on the right track. And we as a community, I think, have a requirement that we get behind it because I can tell you for a fact, outside of planetary, no one sees the distinction between planetary astro. They don't. And if they see us bitching about Mars not return, even if we may not want it as much as someone else in the room, they will give the money to Artemis. Yep. And I can tell you for a fact, this should be the first of the big projects we do, not the last. And in 10 years, we're going to be here again, looking for money for whatever, hopefully Venus sample return. But the point is, <laughs> this is the time for the community to get behind Mars sample return. And I say that as a Venus fanatic. Yeah. So I want to make sure that as a community, we understand how important this moment is too. Thank, thank you, you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Okay. Much Amanda, appreciated. Yeah. Before you before you go, um, we are over time, but are you uh, comfortable with continuing until we get these uh, four? I am OK continuing with these four. Um, okay. I appreciate everyone who stuck around. Um, I, I know it's a long evening, but I always want to make sure we have enough time to, to answer people's questions. So, yeah, okay, we can do. The, how about we do these four and then that'll be we'll cut things off. OK. All right. Thank you for being here and for staying. Um, Amanda Hendricks again. My question is for Joel. Okay. Um, and Joel, for future CLIPS missions, I think you might have talked about this at PAC last week, but I missed it. Um, is the plan, right Right now the CLIPS providers have pretty much open reign over what is they carry, that's their payloads. Are you thinking- Maybe The non-NASA instruments that, that exactly, they put on their yeah, missions, yeah. 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 Um, are you thinking that you'll continue that process? Or are you going to consider updating task orders for future missions to have some sort of oversight in some way about what's on the payloads? We're not planning right now to have oversight over non-NASA equipment on other organizations' missions, like the commercial companies. There are some policy issues the U.S. government is looking at. So, for example... Uh, whether we're, the U.S. government may want to um, make some changes to how we how we deal with um, co some commercial companies, other partners. So, for example, you probably are aware that before Peregrine Mission One launched, the Navajo Nation 
went to the U.S. government and said, um, it, you know, uh, in the 1990s, after a lunar prospector carried Gene Shoemaker's ashes to the surface of the moon at the end of Lunar Prospector, that NASA told the Navajo Nation through the then administration that we would notify them if if a mission were to carry ashes to the surface of the moon. And the Navajo Nation objects to that, you know, based on their religious beliefs. The in this case, um, because that payload was not the mission was not a NASA mission, the payload was not a NASA payload, and we don't manifest human memorial things like that on NASA payloads going to the moon. It's not our policy. Um, we did not consult, NASA did not consult with the Navajo Nation. We had we had believed because of um, Astrobotics public announcements of what was going to be on their mission that people were informed of what they were going to carry commercially. But that led, but when they the Navajo Nation went back to the administration, to NASA and to the FAA to say that they were really surprised that no one had reached out to them. Things like that are being looked at through interagency coordinating bodies, you know, that because the, everyone that operates even commercially out, out of the United States, in effect, is like a U.S. flag carrier. They go under the authority of the United States membership in the Outer Space Treaty. So you have to be very careful that even commercial organizations comply with the Outer Space Treaty. So, yeah. uh, you know, we think about planetary protection mm. and the regulatory gap problems that we're now facing with the commercial missions, not really so much to the moon, but potentially to other bodies. It seems to me that this sort of falls under that umbrella of the regulatory gap problem. Yeah, and I would Hopefully say, it's, a, it's a way of addressing it. I was going to say both. I think the Congress and the current administration understand there's this regulatory gap, that there really needs to be a hold of government regulatory apparatus in place. And there are discussions going on now between different departments of the administration and also the Congress about what is the way to close that gap. Great. And we'll be responsive to that, of course. Thanks. John Christoph, Smithsonian. Um, I'm not sure who should answer this question, but I'll start by saying thank you to Lori for mentioning that all of our other federal agencies are in a similar boat right now. And that really felt driven home for me because at my host institution, the watchword is base erosion. Since I had been born, my museum has had basically a flatline budget, but has not been able to replace staff as they've retired. And so people are doing more with less. Uh, when I was a kid, we were in the NASA administration of Dan Golden, and the watchwords were faster, better, cheaper, doing more with less. Um, at the one of the places I'm currently thinking of working next, NIST, I've had colleagues tell me they're not able to keep instruments running because of inconsistency in budget that are national priority instruments, and that you know programs that are designated in specific budgetary line items separately from the agency budget are unable to function because they don't have facilities that are waterproof. They're having roof leaks in some of their facilities. To say nothing of all of the state universities and other organizations that are being cut by state level budgets. So I hear several presentations of yours talking about advocacy. At what point does it become productive, more productive for us to think about our advocacy for science, not merely as a single agency project, institution mm -hmm. or science mission, but as a general principle against public austerity and start bridging those connections with our partner institutions, the people we work with on a day-to-day -day basis outside of NASA to make that happen. Does that need to happen like now, yesterday? Like at what point of budgetary austerity do we need to stop and say like, let's work with everyone else? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think you've made a really, really good point. I really appreciate you making that here. Um, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, we're going to hear you and, and see what we can do from our side. But I also really encourage the whole community, and I'm sorry that we have such an empty room at this point, because I really do think that this is an opportunity for our community to work through professional organizations like the AAS and others um, to, to try and make a difference, right? And that's not um, agency specific, right? It is advocating for science um, in general. Now, you know, I can't tell anyone to go ask for money, but um, I do think we can advocate for science. Um, and so that's that's something that I would ask our individuals in the community to try and work together. Thank you. Thank I you. really appreciate your point. Oh, yeah. Jake wants to add to that as well. Yeah. And just one thing to add to that. Um, I've talked a little bit about our architecture definition document. Um, we've begun a yearly process of engaging with the community. We hold workshops with our international partners and then a separate workshop with our industry and academic partners. 
Uh, but last year, we actually held a cross-agency uh, workshop as well to begin maybe not fully addressing what you're speaking about, but it is valuable to speak to each other about what we're working on. Um, and I, I agree with Lori's comment. I mean, we're limited in what we can request uh, that others do, but uh, we are trying to engage with each other and make sure that we're aware of, of uh how we're proceeding with uh, with setting up our uh, our budgets to conduct the research that we're being asked to do. Matt Jones, Brown University. Uh, I believe this question would be for Sarah, but I might be mixing up the presentations. Um, so I'm curious, uh, it's excellent that there are opportunities for more senior grad students to get involved with projects. I'm just curious if you have any particular recommendations for more junior grad students to sort of set their sights toward that sort of thing, or if there are alternative um, opportunities for more junior grad students? Uh, so there are, uh, I mentioned the Lunar Surface Science Workshops. Those are, again, completely free and completely open and completely virtual. So you don't have to have any resources <laughs> to attend them. That's intentional. Um, and we actually do um, use grad students as, as sort of like documentarians for those, whatever. And so um, if you send me an email and I can add you to that list, we are happy to have, have that. Um, I think, um, you know, working with your advisor to, to make sure that you can attend workshops and, and like league meetings and things uh, where you can really start to become an active member of the community is a great way to, to start to get involved um, as you sort of build your build up to, to being more senior grad student. Great, thank you. I'm Mike Hecht, uh, MIT, and I see nobody behind me. So I just want should be the last to thank you all for your patience, not only in standing here and answering our questions, but for enabling all the amazing things this community does. So thank you for that. Um, my question, I guess, is for Jake. Uh, we've just uh, con concluded, I think, what I consider a very, very successful partnership uh, over ISRU with Perseverance. I was the PI or am the PI for Moxie, and we worked well with all the science instruments and Perseverance, uh, very productive and I think enriching for both communities. I'm hearing rumblings of ISRU experiments for the moon, and I'm just wondering if they will be integrated in the same way with the science program on the moon. I certainly think it should be. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, it's great points to make, and uh, and um, I'll try to address the question part to it. But I'll I'll first start by saying, um, Lunar and Planetary Science Conference is a is a wonderful conference talking about the research science we're all doing. Uh, but there are a number of other workshops that are held that are um, involve different aspects of NASA. So our uh, Space Technology Mission Directorate uh, sponsors a group called uh, the Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium. That's another area where we discuss this topic um, in a little more detail. Uh, last year, uh, the ELSEC group held their conference at uh, in Pittsburgh, and um, we actually had a rather lengthy conversation about ISRU and how it might uh, might be implemented throughout Artemis, uh, and then thinking forward into to other destinations. And so there is a robust conversation going on now between our directorates um, inside NASA, uh, recognizing that often I, you know, I, I kind of joke around about this is where the Spider-Man meme comes in. We say, who's responsible for ISRU? And everybody's pointing at everybody else. And so we're trying to back up and say, okay, what needs to actually happen so that we can do this? Um, and who is, is responsible? Another aspect we have to take into consideration is that ISRU, in some cases, is wrapped up into um, a lot of the company's business models that they would maybe prefer to uh, to apply. So as we're learning as we go here with this new paradigm of, uh, of how we explore, um, we have to take all of that into account. And so there's a, a conversation going on. Ultimately, to address your question more specifically, kind of dancing around it at the moment, um, the way we look at our mission opportunities, we refer to it as utilization. And so utilization would be any way that a researcher, technology demonstration, um, anybody funding any of those activities would uh, potentially use uh, the Artemis opportunities. So for each mission, as we identify what utilization capabilities are available, we'll work across our directorates to try and address what might be flown. And so 
understanding how an ISRU campaign is different than a science campaign is one thing we're working to understand so that we can determine what needs to be flown. And then we would look to take advantage of the opportunities that we have. So maybe that's a long-winded way of saying, yes, ISRU uh, related capabilities could be flown on Artemis missions, but we have to develop the strategy for how we really want to go do that right now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all for uh, staying for NASA night and uh, uh, join me in thanking our headquarters colleagues for all of their uh, insights. Thank you, Eileen.